two sessions of the afternoon and the day. Uh, I want to just welcome Hans Peter and also thanks Hans Peter. Is he's coming from Austria, so it's a long flight for him. So welcome to the stage. Thank you. Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this afternoon session. Um, we want to share and explain to you today how uh, you can build cloud native applications with a modern uh, stack called Quarkus. And uh, the idea is that you walk away first with knowing what Quarkus is, if you don't know, that, know, know it already. Second, why it might be a great fit for your next uh, Java project. And third, and most importantly, we also want to show you something after doing some, some introductory slides. So we have two blocks of, of live coding uh, planned for that session. So uh, that you see and, uh, and get a first impression and feeling how, uh, you know, convenient and joyful development these days for Java apps uh, has become thanks to Quarkus. Now, before diving in, a few quick words about ourselves. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm based in Austria, which is pretty much in the center of Europe. I'm a developer advocate here at Red Hat. Um, uh, feel free to reach out to me and stay in touch on Twitter. I'm quite active there. If Twitter is not your thing, um, yeah, you can use uh, my email address and drop me a line any time. I really appreciate that I can do this uh, session together uh, with uh, Neha, who will also do and join us later then for the second part of the demo. Please introduce yourself briefly. Hi all, I'm Neha Gupta, Associate Specialist Solution Architect at Red Hat, and I work with enterprises to help them in moving towards, uh, you know, how they can utilize the open source technology and uh, create a futuristic architecture which is cloud ready, also modernize. So that was like a short introduction about me. Thank I'll you, handle. thank you. Uh, we will see more of you then uh, during the demo part. So uh, whenever something new pops up on the horizon, such as Quarkus, uh, it wasn't there forever, right? It uh, was uh, introduced at one point. Uh, you've seen it probably in the keynotes uh, earlier today, introduced later than Spring Boot. You might legitimately question, why should you look into something new? Why does it make sense to find yet another way to develop Java applications? And I think there are a couple of reasons, but one is uh, related to uh, a certain amount of overhead that is there when we run Java applications. This overhead is to some degree um, related to startup times that might be slower for Java apps than for lower level languages, uh, but more so there is a higher memory consumption usually for Java application. This becomes particularly interesting and important when we run in containers. Now, several uh, here in the audience are probably too young to remember that uh, there was once a time where the overhead uh, we are referring to on that slide uh, essentially didn't matter. You could forget about it. It was a time where we uh, basically started and bootstrapped very large enterprise software on application servers running on really beefy machines. But, you know, the industry changed, uh, and in recent years, and today, of course, we do something else also. Java moved forward and is used today for many different other types of, of applications than just monoliths. And so if you have things like uh, other architectures in mind, microservices, or uh, maybe you want to write your serverless functions with Java, then this overhead from the previous slide becomes um, very, very important. It can hurt us a lot. It starts to matter a lot the more fine-grained and the more distributed our software architectures become. And so, what is Quarkus and how can it help us with, uh, with uh, those challenges, in particular when we have cloud-native uh, applications in mind? So, one of the first things you find is that Quarkus is specifically tailored for Kubernetes-native workloads. This very often means, again, to reiterate that, using newer architectural styles such as microservices and serverless runtimes such as Knative, um, but the important thing to understand is it doesn't have to be like that. So if all you wish for is a, a monolithic application, it's perfectly fine to use Quarkus for that as well and build your monolith uh, with Quarkus. That's very often something that people tend to forget because irrespective of what architectural style we are aiming at, Quarkus basically brings the same uh, tooling, the same benefits and the same great developer experience. So it, this is totally detached from the architecture you have in mind. Uh, and so we're going to see uh, some of those things that Quarkus brings regarding developer experience later in the two uh, live coding blocks as well. But just to give you a few uh, hints up front, there is uh, something that is called the dev mode in Quarkus. And this dev mode has a couple of really nice things. One is that we have live 
reload functionality. This is maybe something when you're coming from another background like Node.js that, that you say, well, yeah, we have that for ages, but in Java this is not uh, something that you could commonly rely on. We will see that. Uh, then in addition to that, uh, the dev mode has a suite of uh, uh, so-called dev services that it brings to the table. And what that dev services do for us is they automatically detect what uh, extensions, what dependencies we add to our project. And when those dependencies refer to external services such as databases, caches, messaging systems and things like that, uh, Quarkus will automatically spin containers up in the background for us and run a Postgres database or a MongoDB database or an InfiniSpan cache or a Kafka. Uh, and it does that without any uh, need of configuration uh, in, in the application properties. So it just works. And then finally, uh, building native executables, also something that is particularly interesting when you have serverless uh, scenarios in mind. Um, here Quarkus seamlessly basically interacts with GraalVM and uh, uses GraalVM's native image um, um, compilation functionality to build native executables out of these Java applications. So another important aspect that's often forgotten when it comes to developer experience is freedom of choice. So the idea is not that Quarkus tries to impose a particular way of, of writing your code onto you. You can choose whatever best fits your use case. And in this case, I'm referring to uh, uh, both programming models that you have available in Quarkus. You can use the imperative way of writing code, but other developers, in particular those that might come from other language backgrounds, they might want to do reactive programming. And that's also fine. Um, with, with Quarkus, it doesn't have to be a strict either-or decision. You can just like use, even if you want to and need that, mix and match both of these uh, programming models in the same application. Now, we also mentioned cloud native a couple of times already, and with it comes the necessity to, uh, well, containerize our applications and workloads. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that Quarkus has been built from the ground up with containers in mind. And what's most important to know about that is not these observable benefits that are listed here, but the actual results we get out of these benefits. So Quarkus builds artifacts for us that are optimized in disk size which in turn leads to smaller container images. Then the, uh, the optimized um, artifacts that Quarkus builds, they are, tend to start up faster, considerably faster, in particular when we would use native executable. And this is then a very good fit for instantaneous scale-out needs that we might have in serverless scenarios. And finally, the, uh, in general, lower resource consumption, CPU as well as memory, means of course we have uh, higher deployment at in, uh, densities that we can achieve in our uh, Kubernetes environment. So at the end of the day, we can save money by, by doing that. And so all of these are really desired uh, properties for containers, uh, but there's more to it. Like when we think about wanting to have <coughs> applications that run on Kubernetes, they should have several fundamental capabilities uh, from an application perspective. Things like offering metrics, uh, having health check endpoints, offering debugging and tracing mechanisms so that we can figure out when we have problems what's going wrong with the application. And then of course also we want to configure and use uh, like config maps, secrets and, and, and other Kubernetes uh, resources uh, and inject them into the container. And all of that basically supported out of the box with Quarkus. And everything you develop with Quarkus also builds on open standards. Like, m many of you, I, I, I'm sure, are familiar with those standards that are listed here. So we can do dependency injection using a subset of the CDI uh, bean specification. We can write our REST endpoints using ChucksRS. We can use JPA and JTA annotations for transactional persistence. So uh, all of that we have used also in the past in, 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 in one way or another is there in Quarkus as well. Many other things as well. So no, Quarkus does not reinvent the wheel in all these areas. It just like brings together and builds upon really uh, battle-tested and popular libraries and technologies, all of which are open source. Now there's just one more thing that I want to uh, figure out together with you quickly before we go to the, to the hands-on part. And it's what's the secret sauce, if you want to, behind Quarkus. Uh, and so I think it's key in that regard to understand uh, the fundamentally different way that Quarkus takes for building applications when you compare it to more traditional stacks of frameworks. First, the traditional way. 
we just write our code, we compile it, it's packaged together with all the dependencies into a deployable artifact, say a runnable char. So not much things are happening at build time, usually. Then when we run the application, a lot of things start to happen. Framework mechanisms kick in, config file passing, class path loading, class path scanning, annotation and other metadata processing, runtime code generation to build uh, dynamic proxies, and all other sorts of things that are time and consuming and resource intensive. And our Quarkus addresses exactly that and tries to do uh, it in, in, in an opposite way. It tries to move as many of the activities that are resource and time intensive to the build phase. So this means when the time comes that we want to run our build artifact, most of these things have already been done up front, and this is also basically the reason why it can uh, start significantly faster and also with consistently lower memory usage. Uh, talking about uh, this, the bottom line is that with Quarkus we do more at build time so that we need to work less at runtime. And when it comes to the runtime, again, we have two options. Usual, the usual option, still heavily used, is to take our build artifacts and run them on the JVM. This is perfectly fine. But then again, you can use GraalVM uh, to compile down those uh, uh, build artifacts to native executables thanks to this native image functionality of GraalVM. But with that, let's uh, move to uh, the live coding part and see some of the stuff in action, okay? So for that, let me go out of the slides quickly. Let me just check. I have a mini cube up and running here, so my local Kubernetes, if you want to. And I'm going to use the Quarkus CLI to create an app from scratch. It's a very, admittedly, very simple app, but it suffices to show uh, most of the things regarding um, uh, developer experience that you get. So let me switch into that folder. Let me fire up Visual Studio Code quickly. So this is a project. It was generated by the Quarkus CLI. It uses Maven as the build tool. You could also use Gradle if you prefer that. I'm getting old, so I'm sticking to Maven here. So the project structure is pretty familiar. We have a Java folder, test folder in, in, in the sources. We have application properties. They are empty. And I'm going to spin up one or two terminals real quick. Um, let me do that. And then I mentioned the dev mode, right? And this dev mode, again, you, if you use the CLI, you just say Quarkus dev. And then the application, it is automatically scaffolded from the CLI, will start, okay? And now it's up and running, and we will come back to that uh, in, in a few moments again, but we can go there. Just open the application. This is a static index page that was auto-generated. Uh, and we have also automatically, because we have some demo codes there, also generated a simple REST endpoint. So it says just hello from REST easy reactive. So it, it's a POM file that was scaffolded, and it uses just a couple of, of dependencies and settings there that were automatically set up, like I said, during this Quarkus create application command. And so with that, uh, let's see some of the code here. So this resource, Chuck's RS resource, was automatically generated. Let me just make a very simple change at first. And remember, the application is just running. I'm hitting save. I'm going to the browser. I'm hitting refresh. And it's refreshed. OK, so yeah, OK, this change is basically a, state, a constant string. But let's do a couple of more things here. Let's uh, take the API uh, and make a different path for that resource, or so maybe at uh, another path definition down here. Let's say this is a greed endpoint under API greed, and let's give it some uh, even like path parameter so that we can choose who we greet. We can change the method name here. We use the path parameter that gets injected from, from, the, from uh, the rest call here. It's a string. Let's make it a string. Let's say who, and let's use that here. Let's say hi and add who here. So if we do that and go back to the browser again, I just uh, uh, saved. I obviously have to change that here to API slash greet slash Neha. Let's greet Neha, my co-speaker here. And it says, hi, Neha. So we changed a couple of things, right? We can also do more things. We can make more changes that are reloaded live as we code along. We can introduce configuration properties, okay? using the Eclipse micro-profile specification here. 
let's introduce a custom greeting here, just to have some thing that gives a little bit of more dynamic nature to that application. And let's call it custom greeting as well. Well, it reminds us immediately we, have, we don't have that property. So if we go there, we see, yes, that's true. There is no property, custom greeting. Let's say, good afternoon. Okay, I, I, I hit save again, I go here. Let's refresh. And nothing happens, right? Nothing happens, the reason nothing happens is Maybe you spotted it, I didn't use the configuration property yet. So that was a pretty clear that nothing happened so far, but let's say custom greeting, and then add that down here, again refresh, and we have good afternoon Neha. So we can also live reload uh, like uh, things from coming from the application properties that get injected. And I never had to stop, restart, re recompile, or any other like explicit interaction was needed for, for doing that. So with that, um, let's uh, figure out one more thing. Uh, remember we said support for Kubernetes, support for containers, and usually this means uh, things like, okay, you need to come up with a Docker file somehow, or, or you need to write some YAML and fight the YAML syntax and stuff like that. But it doesn't have to be like that. So let me go to the command line here real quick. And here I'm cheating a little bit so that I don't have to type and mistype the names, but what we basically do is we ask the Quarkus CLI to add two extensions here, the Quarkus Kubernetes extension and a second one, the container image chip extension. So chip is a Google project to build containers without Docker files, basically, to sum it up quickly. And now that we have those two things, we can just add a couple of configuration properties. Let me do that real quick here. And I'm going to explain that soon. I'm just adding that and run Quarkus build down here. Now that we made some changes that are related to how we want this application to be built by Quarkus. We say we want to have a char file as an output. We want a container that, need, that should uh, get built. Yeah, here we have some, some issue. Let's, let's see what, what we have. Oh yeah, see, we have a test failure. So we quickly fix, because we're all good developers. I don't want to skip those tests. Let me quickly fix the test, okay? That's important because also a test was generated here. And just so that you see that, how this works, Quarkus does continuous testing. So it realized, oh, there's something wrong with the test. So let's quickly fix the test here together. We again inject that property here. Um, and then we can, of course, adapt the test real quick. A path param, it's called. Path param, say who, not how, but who. Then we greet Neha again in the test, and we say this is API greet who. And then we say we just fix the expected output if, if we do that. So we should have our custom greeting, followed by that, followed by who. And ideally, let me go back to the command line resume and check the tests. Tests are still not running fine and the reason is there is probably a small typo in my test. Yeah, here, of course, this has to be Neha as well. This is a fixture here. So, let's see. The test runs. It's passing again, so now the build should pass again. So, continuous testing is something very nice because you see immediately when you break something in your code, so that was good that this happened, and then we're gonna build that. And when we build that now, now the tests are running, they are running fine, and so what it does is it builds a container image for us, and it also is going to deploy that container into my Minikube environment locally, okay? So this is about to finish very soon, so when I go here then to the command line, so the build process is done, it now builds the container image, and here you see it deploys to Kubernetes server, it's Minikube on my local machine. It applied a service and a deployment to that. Now if we take a look at that here real quick, we have this pod up and running, and this pod is, let's just check the logs quickly, kubectl logs for that pod. It's our Quarkus application serving the REST endpoint. And, and to, to quickly verify that, we can expose that service here real quick. And this gets into my browser and then it forwards that into the application running in a container in my Kubernetes bot. And I'm here on the same index page that we have seen earlier. And so I say API greet 
everyone. I want to greet everyone. And it says, good afternoon, everyone, out of the pod and the container that that pod is running. And remember, we haven't even touched a Docker file. We haven't even touched a YAML file. And, and this happens automatically in the background. Uh, so let me just show that to you real quick. Um, and then I'm basically done already. So this is the YAML file that was automatically scaffolded behind the scenes. Uh, it uses a Kubernetes uh, service here. Uh, to uh, expose uh, the deployment that is created down here. A and yeah, the container was created. Let's take a look at that quickly as well, and then I'm about to finish. So we have that container that I built about a minute ago, um, and this is the container that was deployed to that Kubernetes environment. That basically concludes this um, short, quick demo of showing you uh, the interactive nature and the live reload functionality and a couple of other things that uh, Quarkus brings to the table. With that, I'm done and I want to switch over to, the, uh, to Neha for the second part of the demo. She's uh, showing us uh, a little bit about how we can work with existing applications. Existing applications that might have even been written with, with a different framework such as Spring and she shows you how to do a migration for that. Thank you for now. Thank you, Hans Peter. By now, you might have all got pretty much idea about how Quarkus works and uh, how easily you can get started with it. You don't need to, uh, you know, learn much of a coding. It's basically explain you what I'm going to do in the demo. So what I will be doing is uh, I have one application which is written in Springboard, and uh, it's a to-do task management system. Uh, it is full-fledged developed in Spring MVC using, uh, you know, JPA and then interacting with uh, database also having a Swagger UI inbuilt in the application. So what we will do is we will migrate this application from Spring Boot to Quarkus framework and we will use uh, some tool which is known as MTA and uh, also known as uh, Red Hat Migration Toolkit for application. So with the help of that tool we will be analyzing the application as a first step. And once we analyze the issues which, uh, you know, uh, steps which are needed to fix the, uh, sorry, to migrate our application from Spring Boot to Quarkus, we will be fixing each of those issues. And after ah, fixing, then the application should be, you know, front, very well uh, uh, capable enough to run in a Quarkus method. So right now I'm in a Red Hat Code Ready Studio and uh, this is my application code. So nothing to, you know, go deep dive over here. I'll, what I will do is I will quickly run this application. And what it is doing is it is in the background using a Postgres SQL database, which is running as a container on my machine. So I'll be starting that database first. Just to explain you the command, uh, what I'm doing is I'm starting the my Postgres uh, container and passing some of the environment variables such as what will be the username and password in order to connect to the DB. So let's start the database. So now our DB is up and running. Let's go and start the application. So uh, I'm in my project directory already. So if I do ls, so I can see all the files. Let us start the application. So we'll be using Maven wrapper for starting the application. Spring board. Okay. So now the application is started. Let's try to, you know, check if it's running properly or not. Okay. Yeah, so here is the application. Let's try to add some task to it. Okay, once added, you can, you know, just play around with it. You click it and if you want to delete it. And what thing I wanted to show you in this application was this below green line where we can see the uh, support of open API standard 3. Then we have an inbuilt swagger UI. So I'll, be, I'll just clicking on it. Right. We also have a swagger UI which you know comes with some set of uh, RESTful APIs. Directly using these APIs you can interact with your applications. And then it pretty much gives you a, you know, a metrics, Prometheus gives you the metrics using which you can get the details about what is the heap size, what is the memory size the application is using, using to run. 
Then uh, there is one more mapping which is uh, of the health point which tells you whether your application is up and running. So this is how the application runs, okay. So now let us do uh, the analysis of the application. So we, I wanted to, I, tell, I told you about the MTA, right. So I will be going and showing you that. So just to uh, get you idea about what migration toolkit for application is, it's a migration toolkit mostly for the Java based applications and you use this tool to analyze your application not only analysis but also you know uh, uh, do the actual migration. You can uh, uh, download this uh, application let me tell you. It's like free open source like if you want to explore the product you can just go to the download link and it's available in different varieties so you can run it as a container. You can run it as a web console on your local environment, then there is a CLI version also available. So just for the sake of saving time, I will be using the MTA CLI version to interact with it without installing it on my local machine. And uh, what this tool will do, it will uh, check yeah, my yeah. all the source code yeah, yeah, line yeah, of yeah. code and then it will analyze yeah. it, it will create a report dashboard for me. That's so let's awesome. run the you know command for uh, creating the report. Yeah. So what it is, it is doing is this MTA is starting and uh, you can see the version as well which, is, which it is showing it is 5.3 and uh, what it will do is it will scan the code and then create a report and store it at some place. So I am just waiting for it to complete the report analysis and then we will go through the list and analyze the application that what are the issues or what are the things needed to change in order uh, you know for my application to move from Spring Boot to Quarkus. It's a very beautiful tool let me tell you because I have used it and uh, I we have uh, done some uh, workshop as well for our customers where we have migrated their application from uh, you know Java, monolithic Java application to the cloud native application and we have also done the platform, re-platform. So it not only supports the migration of application, it provides you different, uh, if you know the 6 R factors for migrating or modernizing your application. So there are different factors like uh, refactoring, re-platforming or re-hosting. So it tells you that whether your application, uh, what kind of uh, you know change is required. So let me uh, go to the report. So here is something the report is getting stored. So once loaded you can see uh, it is telling you the list of applications. So right now this is my application in which I have uh, you know scanned my project. Uh, this 32 is the number of points or you can say the number of incidents which this uh, uh, tool has identified as a you know uh, the things to change in the application. So uh, let me go in the project. Once you go it gives you a graphical view about the uh, how many number of uh, incidents are mandatory like they are needed to change how many are potential which means like they might cause issues going further so it's better to you change them and then some information which you might know about your application. So just to check the issues in our ap current application I will go into the issue sections. So uh, yeah so these are the list of mandatory issues. And uh, here I would like you to focus on uh, one of the issues, let me just quickly check it, this one. So replace the spring parent form with the uh, Quarkus uh, bomb. So what it is telling, if I click on it, it gives you the detail about the you know uh, issue detail, like it is telling replace the spring parent application because it is not supported in Quarkus. It also gives you the reference link, so in case you don't know what are the format and how to implement it in the code, you can quickly go to it and then just uh, uh, write it in your code accordingly. So it also tells you the line of code at where the it has identified, so we can see the file name, the issue is in the file. Uh, name pom.xml. So I will be going in pom.xml and uh, if you see over here it is highlighting all the number of lines where the change needs to be done. So such as it was mentioning to replace the pom file, uh, pom parent form directory right. 
So, uh, this is line number 4, then it is also telling us to replace some of the dependencies like spring web which is not supported in Quarkus. So, it is also giving you the links like uh, what can be used as a replacement for those. So, let us go and uh, make these changes in our application based on these suggestions which the report has suggested us. So, I will be going back to my source code. So, this is my pom.xml. So, here if you see uh, line number 4, right? Here is the parent directory, I can remove it. Then it mentioned about Spring Web. So, all the dependencies which are related to Spring, right? Basically. So, I will be removing all of them. Now we have to add each of them whatever we have removed. So, just to save time what I have done is I have already created the you know updated pom.xml with all the Quarkus libraries. So, I will use that like use that file. Let me just add it then I will explain it what we have what changes we have made. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, I will say we have already migrated our application from Spring Boot to Quarkus because we have uh, basically changed the entire dependencies or entire libraries which was needed for your application to run as a Spring Boot and now we are suggesting them to use the Sp uh, Quarkus one. So, uh, here if you see all the libraries which were mentioned earlier were using a Spring Web and all, now they are uh, you know referring to the io.quarkus repository. And uh, similarly for building your application, it is using a Maven plugin. So, we have defined that as well over here. So, uh, let us go and do the rerun of your uh, report. So, I will come back here and then rerun my application. But before doing that, uh, let me stop the application which was running previously, right? The, in the spring version. I'll clean it and also stop the DB. Uh, meanwhile, it is standing, uh, scanning my application, I will just do the clean up. So, earlier when we run this application, it was running as a spring, if you can see the banner, uh, this is two up, sorry. But it was running as a spring, now let us run it as Quarkus. So, we will be running our application in Quarkus dev mode. Okay, now it changed, right? Let us go and access the application. It is working as it is. Right, and also let's try to access this, you know, endpoints like Swagger. Okay, so these things are not working, which indicates like we have not fully migrated our application. Like some of the properties files are left. So I had already run the report. So let me check if it got generated or not. Okay, so report is generated. Let me check if uh, we can see the latest report. Okay. So, yeah, the number of incidents have been reduced since we have already fixed all the issues which were related to dependency file and let us go what are these issues. Okay. So, if we see over here it is representing uh, the issue in the application property file which means some of the data sources which were defined from Spring Boot cannot be run in the uh, you know Quarkus framework and we will have to change it according to Quarkus and uh, yeah. So, this is the same then uh, this is also for that only. Okay. Most of them are related to data source. If you see all APIs which we are trying to access the 
mapping points like open api or swagger in all of them the issues are there so which means we have to change those file so let's go back in the code ready and uh, yeah this is the file which it is representing or maybe indicating the issues are there uh, here we have defined all the endpoints as well as the uh, you know details to connect with the database so what we will do is we will change it with the supported ones okay I think now the application should work as it is. Yeah, here it is. So did you notice one thing? I did not went to the terminal to restart my application or recompile, which is one of the you know uh, benefit of Quarkus dev mode. And also if you notice, it is work interacting with DB. For Spring Boot one, I started DB manually, but when I started my Quarkus application, I did not started the DB. What it did, uh, let me show you here in uh, console. In dev mode, if you can read, somewhere it shows that uh, it has started the data source. So, the property files which we updated here, this hypernate ORM database, it automatically created a data schema for my application and I did not have to go and start the, uh, you know, Postgres database manually. So, this was the you know a simple way of showing you how you can migrate your existing application. This is one way of migration, but there are many different ways. You might have complex complex applications, and uh, where you might need to do code level changes. Here, what we changed was more on a configuration level or property level, or you can say the dependencies level. But when you have uh, annotations defined, such as a Spring Boot annotation in your application, so you also have to replace those kind of changes. So that is come that comes under the refactor of uh, you know uh, refactor kind of migration. So this was one way, and then obviously there are other ways which are available on you know uh, this MTA tool how you can use it to migrate it. And this was all about the demo, I believe, and I'm done to. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So we are wrapping it up here. We have just uh, two uh, or three quick uh, quick uh, call for actions here. So if you want to get started with Quarkus, this is uh, where you probably want to start if you're new to it, code of Quarkus IO. Uh, there, then if you want to learn more and dig deeper, there's a really nice ebook, uh, Modernizing Enterprise Job Applications, also free uh, to use. And finally, if you don't want to uh, play around with local Minikube or something like that, uh, go and check out the developer sandbox. Uh, it's a free uh, fully managed uh, open shift environment that you can use for 30 days. That's it. Thanks a lot for joining us and maybe we have time for one or two quick questions. Thanks a lot. Is Corcus is currently used in the production environment for any of the application? Can, can you say again? I had is this Corcus is used in the production environment for any of the applications? Um, I, I didn't He's get asking it. if yeah. the Quarkus is used in the production environment in any of Ah, uh, of, of course, of course. There are a couple of, a couple of customers that are using it. Uh, Red Hat customers, but also like people that are just using like the, the, the upstream open source project. There is a Red Hat support. There's a specific version of Quarkus as well for which you can get support. Uh, I was just showing the, the open source version. Like okay. which... Uh, Sector like health sector are so like in telco telecom sector. Government. I can give one example was recent yeah. in Vodafone where we you know uh, where they migrated their application in Quarkus. So in the in Quarkus, you said uh, uh, the most of the thing will be done at the build time rather than a run time, right? <clears throat> so uh, is that a dependency over? Let's say we are using Spring Boot, right? There is a new feature which has come in Spring in a newer version. But that is not being supported by the Quarkus. How do we get through that? Uh, so the question was related also to to, to the Spring Spring Native, uh, yeah, I think. Some library I'm using. Yeah, you use like Spring Native, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you you we, we were wondering what's the, the the main difference. So there is a new version has come, let's say, with a new feature of it. But Which because it is Quarkus compatible with the Quarkus, right? We need to get a Quarkus based uh, dependency uh, for our project, right? If we are using Quarkus. So you mean for migrating? 
Yeah. Yeah, that so that's definitely something where where I think you mentioned that already that not all not not everything that Spring has is supported in in terms of of annotations, for instance. There are, you, you can find that Quarkus adds extensions. Uh, uh, basically, every version brings new and more Spring support. But you cannot like uh, rely on every Spring feature that it would be available as of today in Quarkus. Maybe you want to add something about no, that. No, you're right. Thanks again, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>